Yeah. So if you're on YouTube, um, there's something going on that's bottlenecking down. Maybe there's too many people watching SpaceX on YouTube. I don't know if they've got something going. All right. So welcome. Yeah, so if you're, it looks like the video was a little slow going to the YouTube, but Facebook seems to be fine. So if you want to jump over to the Facebook and watch it, if the video is streaming smoother. Uh, we checked our system and it seems it, we're, we're putting out everything the exact same, so we can't help that. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 17 if you want to go ahead and open up there. We'll, and I do have our comments up, so if you would like to participate in providing some uh, chat, you know, get that up there. I think it's just a temporary thing, so I don't think it'll, a lot of times those issues are network beyond us. It's not something we can necessarily fix, so. Okay, so, get that. All right, before we jump into this, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Our most wonderful and merciful Father, again, we humble ourselves as we come before you for this study, this study of your word. We thank you, Father, for the wisdom that is, we were able to obtain from this study. We pray that we'd be able to use this and that we will use it to help shape our lives and how we interact with everybody and make ourselves into more the image of your son. We pray that you be with those who are with us today, whether they're on live stream or wherever they're at, that you would help to safeguard them from the evil one. We pray that you'd be with those who aren't able to join us this morning, that you would help them to overcome the challenges or problems that they're facing. And we ask all this in Christ's name, amen. So last time we got to chapter 17, and Paul in the second missionary journey has approached Berea, and that's where we then go from Berea. We're in Greece, we're in that area of Greece, um, and in there we're going to see where at Berea his encounter but I want to bring up again this pattern, this pattern, this pattern of what Paul does when he uh, approaches a new area. And I think this is one that um, we see as he arrives every time. One, he preaches the gospel. Um, we see the response that some believe, some disbelieve and cause trouble. It always seems to be the disbelievers causing problems and not just walking away from it. Um, yes, I... Uh, Aline, Suzanne, you want to text Aline and tell her we're having, I don't know what it is, but apparently Facebook is working. Text her and let her know. I don't know what, why. She says we have no audio. Um, so we'll try to work on that as we continue. So as, as the disbelievers, it's, it's interesting how disbelievers, people who, uh, man, how they, they have to cause trouble. I, I, what's that? Haters. Haters. You know, I posted a thing on Facebook. I don't know if you saw that. You see that? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the first thing, instead of just ignoring it, people who disagree, who don't believe in God, uh, my posting was uh, praying for the by praying for our country to return to biblical principles. I think something like that. And oh man, I you know I had a person that responded, church and state, and then go on about it. I'm like I'm not asking for a theocracy. I'm not trying to say that. Biblical principles, biblical moral values. So it's it's like the idea that you know is there is there goodness? Do we not want people to return to goodness? Good thing? i got to quiet that. Let me, my text. Okay. Thank you, Suzanne. <laughs> she just shot out a text, but i got to mute my phone or it's going to drive me nuts, too. So I make it to where I can hear it, and now I can hear it, but it's driving me nuts, my, my phone. Because I was missing some text messages. But it was just amazing to me how 
that you can't, people who, it's not that they just dislike, I think they hate. Like Becky, you said, they're haters. They just hate the concept of, of a God. And honestly, it comes back to judgment. It comes back to feeling accountable, feeling guilt. I don't want that. And therefore, and so this person's logic was extremely flawed because it was like they were saying, yeah, but each individual should just basically fundamentally uh, do no harm to others. And then my, my basic thought is, uh, who determines what is doing harm? I can go steal from you. I don't think it's harmful. I determine that it's not harmful for me. Hitler determined a lot of things that weren't necessarily harmful, but for good for the betterment of society. Uh, the Aztecs, they uh, had human sacrifices. There's a lot of people, sociopaths, sociopaths. They have no, you know, what they think is not harmful. They have no concept to that. So there has to be something beside all these fragmented individuals. So anyway, so this is the, the pattern that we see as well, is, uh, the idea of people causing trouble. And then after that, Paul moves on. So Paul, as he comes into uh, Berea, this is an amazing, uh, just, you know, of all the churches you hear, this is a, an amazing description of a group of people who have come to encounter the truth for the first time, the gospel. And the fact that uh, the way they approach it is that they, they received it with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily, matching it up against what's being told them, and, and confirming it. Minds of readiness. They were, they were excited. Mm -hmm. They embraced it. Yeah, they were ready to embrace the truth. They were open to that. That is a condition, honestly, all of our hearts should be. We should always be ready to embrace the truth and, and be willing to listen. You know, there's a lot of times, even myself, I have... I, I, I get to a level where I, I think I know what I know and, and then all of a sudden somebody will say something and challenge that and I get a little unnerved. You know, I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. And, and, it, and then later on I find out it's the truth. I was wrong. And it may be something in the Bible that I thought for years. Maybe something silly. It might just be kind of a historical setting of Babylon or something like that or within the context of, you know, a, a, a scripture. And I've always thought this. I was taught this. Um, and then all of a sudden somebody goes, ah, you know, really, Ron, uh, Cyrus wasn't the blah, blah, blah. And then I'm like, well, I've always known it this way. Instead of being eager to listen, sometimes our first is to, first impulse is to push. And so these people are not. You know, I, I heard one guy talking about how that you know you see churches even today they'll be called the Berean First Berean Church of whatever. Um, there's Bible colleges called uh, there's a Bible Berean Bible College, but you don't see one called the Church of Corinthian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The f first you know the First Baptist Church of Corinth or Corinthian Church of Christ. You know I mean you you're like. No, not, that was really extreme. But even Philippi, Antioch, there's some cities named that that associate, you know, so it might be the Church of Christ at Antioch, I think Missouri uh, somewhere. So, but that to me is it, people using, and that name has become affiliated with what? Somebody wanting to find the truth and doing due diligence. And so... After this, of course, we see that um, we saw last week where those who from Thessalonica who basically drove him out of town with a short period of time and Jason is being drugged down and having to put up basically a bond so that he would ensure that he basically is saying, I'm not going to allow or I won't have this disruption again, um, which means Paul can't come back. Paul basically, if he comes back during this time anyway, yeah, he's, he's, he's going to cause Jason to lose his money. And so I think that's the reason he sends uh, Silas and Timothy back. So immediately they, the brethren at Berea send him off, and then he ends up down here in Athens, and that's going to be our focus this morning, is looking at Athens. Now, Athens was like the, the melting pot of cultures. It was the premium, premium place to send your child 
to get the best education. If you could send your child there um, because of all of the philosophers, uh, Socrates, uh, Plato, um, all of these were gathered in this one location and they came together. And this is really kind of the formation of this idea of a university of studies of all these different principles and specialties. And so this is the place to go. This is the heart of the culture of the Greeks, which the Romans, um, they loved Greek culture and they indoctrinated it. They took all their gods and basically gave them a Roman name, but kept their gods, 12 gods and then the demigods, they kept them. So this is the place that is, uh, we call kind of the New York City, the LA, where a harbor, where a lot of people come in and mingle. So you would think that it would be very open. You know, that, well, you know, you got, it's not like one city stuck off someplace that nobody ever travels to, and those families have been there for generations. And so they would be very resistant to somebody else coming in. But this is not so, but they are, they're still, they have some, some cultural elitism that they, they have. So picking up in 15, chapter 17. Now those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens and receiving a command from Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible. They left. Now Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit being provoked within him as he observed the city full of idols. You know, I don't think you could leave Paul alone and expect him to take a vacation, <laughs> lay low until everybody comes. It, um, and I think it shows the team effort that he's desiring to work with the uh, a group of men. Uh, I don't think it's the only way. I, obviously, it doesn't stop him, but I think that was sort of his um, mode of operation was this idea of having multiple uh, missionaries with him as he would approach and initiate the, the gospel. Um, I think individually, no matter if they're walking down the road, he's by himself. If this came up, he would talk about the gospel. But he's wanting them to come there, and while he's waiting for them, um, He's, he's looking around and he's being provoked in the spirit. Have you ever been provoked in the spirit? Spiritually. Not because your football team lost, you know, but spiritually, yes, absolutely. Um, when I watch some of the crazy stuff on television that is proclaiming to be Christian, it just fires me up. It gets me upset. It makes me want to, you know, scream and, and respond to it. And this is what Paul, Paul cannot help himself and look at this. Now, why would that bother him? Just because he's a Jew that's now a Christian? I think it's deeper than that. I think it has a lot to do with the fact of his spiritual um, heart that he wants. He knows what are the consequences of these people following this. And it's spiritual death. Um, it's, they're going to die in their sins and he knows that if he doesn't try to get them to see the truth they're going to remain in that condition um the hippocratic oath yeah Aline says some docs make their fortune doing abortions among other things yeah that 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 is another one that where people have that um do no harm but they turn around and that comes also from the greeks in that that timeline so it, it, it is something that provokes him and he's observing. So the, one of the ideas we see is he, he looks around, he studies the culture. We have no idea if Paul's ever been to Athens before. I'm sure being an educated man that he knew about Athens, he knew well, well what was there, the philosophies, the education and stuff. Um, but as far as ever experiencing it and being there, not really aware of it, doubt it. Um, because it looks like his age was young enough to where then he went to Jerusalem and trained to Gamaliel and then was converted and then off to Syria. And so don't believe he made it this far. This is probably first time. But it would be very disturbing, especially as a Jew. A Jew, even if he's not a Christian, this would be very disturbing to see all of these, these statues all over the place. Um, and so what does he do? He initiates. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day and those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. 
Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he is preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, we, again, this is, this is a, a unique time that, where we find the gospel has gone to the pagans, started with the Jews, that cultural uh, foundation, then going out to the Greeks and the Greeks with that cultural, but now, now we're at a pinnacle of wisdom according to the world and education according to the world and now we're seeing the gospel come into contact with this level of elitism um, and I'm not going to say that you know I mean because in a lot of ways education is good and don't want to perceive that the, that the Greeks and everything that they did and that they were idiots you know no um, there was a lot of things they were just like anyone else that was looking for knowledge and science and observing nature and trying to understand it um, and but it's but it's also kind of the same situation we see with the gospel when it's presented on the campuses or in education. And this conflict between them. And, and what's interesting is when we look at the Epicureans and the Stoics. Well, let's start first, you know, that, that first verse 17, verse 17, that's the exact same pattern we just talked about. But he's not only doing it in the synagogues, but anyone who would talk, anybody that basically could come into contact with in the marketplace every day um, and then in the mix of this he's come across some of these Epicureans and Stoics now these are like polar opposites it's almost like the Pharisees and the Sadducees worse they're they, they don't get along um, and this is another observation that it always seems like that the enemy of your enemy seems to come at you also so you know enemies two people who are enemies with each other they will join together to attack you, <laughs> to attack the gospel. And that's what we saw with the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Um, we see Pilate, remember, and Herod became good friends after Jesus. <laughs> you know, they all, the high priest, they all kind of, why? Because they had a common hatred. And that common hatred, of course, is against God. And I find that as well. When you look at all these people with different... Uh, almost conflicting cultural values in our uh, country today. Boy, they'll all jump together and sign up together to attack God. You know, they, it's just fascinating to me, you know, the groups that honestly, their foundational philosophies are contradictive in these woke culture and stuff. But boy, if you, a Christian was to pipe up, they'd all jump on us. And that's what we kind of see here, the Epicureans. Uh, Epicurus was a philosopher between 342 um, and 227 BC. Um, his idea, Epicureans, was basically he got, I, the process led him, let's just say, to simplify, uh, that true pleasure was that you need to experience it. It's, so it was about the flesh, desire, and that's how you could experience life and come to understand it. You know, the old idea that, you know, if something hurts you, then that's kind of a bad philosophy. That's something you don't do. But if something pleasures you, then that's something good. And that's the kind of direction. So it's all about pleasure. Sound familiar? Yeah. It's never changed, you know. Even though we have Epicurus that founded this philosophy, that philosophy started all the way back in, the, in right out of the Garden of Eden. All of these. Now, Stoics, we probably have heard of Stoics. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, uh, the emperor, uh, Roman emperor, really was a, a very renowned Stoic. There's a lot of the philosophies and quotes I even see Christians using, um, and they're not bad because it's about self-control. There's a lot of aspects of the Stoics, but they are completely, they're pantheons, pantheists. They believe that we are God, we are the human is self-sufficient, um, and so we are a part of the unity of deity, this greater thing. Um, and if we look at the, honestly, the apostolic world at that time, these are the two philosophies. So it's beautiful that God has brought Paul to Athens when he does to contradict and to engage these two foundational philosophies. It's almost like a third party in America that's going to challenge 
the Republican and Democrat Party. And now you're going to see something different. We've seen that happen, haven't we? The Tea Party. What was the one with, uh, there was another one that split it in the 80s. A little short guy from Texas, you remember that? What's his name? But, you know, what did it do? It caused those two basic philosophies, whether it was political or whatever. And that's what we find is this is going to cause both of them to almost unite against us. So Paul is starting to come into contact with these teachers, their Stoics and philosophers, uh, Stoics and Epicureans. So um, this is the type of philosophies that are being taught in the university there. So therefore, the educated is going to walk away and travel back home. Your kids are going to come back to Rome from going to college in Athens. And guess what they're going to come back with? They're going to be a Stoic or an Epicurean. So you can see where that this permeated the Mediterranean, the empire, was Stoics, Epicureans. Now that happens to us. I mean, look at our universities, our higher, higher education, same thing. Our kids, our children, and all of us have gone to an educational system that has instilled a certain value system and then changed. I mean, when I grew up, we could pray, we could have the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, we, at the university, when I go, when I went was, we, we could speak freely about religious things, the professors, you know, it was completely different. And that permeated out when people graduated and left. But it was coming, even in my generation. Now, no. Um, they're getting this Epicurean and Stoic type of philosophies. They're not calling it that, put back in, and it's agnostic. It's creating agnostics and atheists. And that is what is permeating our generation the same way that the Stoics and the Epicureans were perme permeating uh, the ap apostolic generation as well. Um, so they, um, the idea here is this idle babbler, um, spermos logos is the word there, and it means seed, uh, word, seed. It's somebody, it's like a bird, you know, a bird would go and just kind of pick up a seed of different things. And so the concept behind here is when the Greeks would say this, with this idea of a bird that just got a bunch of seed thoughts, ideas, and it would just peck one, peck one, peck one, peck one, peck one. And so it's babble, babble, babble. It's just got this. And of course, it comes from Babylon, Babel, you know, just, what are you talking about? I can't understand. You're saying so many different things I don't quite understand. Um, but they weren't foreign. Uh, they were educated, so they understood this idea of the, the Yahweh, the Jewish God. They'd heard him, but the proclaimer of this idea of this strange deities is especially that Jesus. Because part of that proclamation would be that this man was God. God was man. That would, and resurrection. The Greeks disdained resurrection, I, I read. You know, they, they had this idea that it was ridiculous. They would mock it. You know, are you serious, really? You're gonna become immortal, you know, the human flesh? So this was a very hard concept from the get-go, was, was the idea that a man could be God and God could be man, and the idea that we could, we could have an afterlife somewhere else. Um, wow. Sound like something similar today? The rejection of Jesus as God and man? Even some who proclaim to be Christians actually teach that he wasn't God? You know? So... You can see almost all of the doctrinal issues that we're challenged with today rooted in this encounter. You see? I mean, it's amazing. It hasn't changed, in other words. We're not special. They weren't special. Counting the same way. So that means to me that this is even a more important uh, conversation to have with this. So they took him, picking up a 19, they took him and they brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching which you are proclaiming for you are bringing strange things to our ears so we want to know what these things mean and here's a little author's note 21 luke inserts now all the athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new um, in other words, they were on Facebook and Twitter. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, so it's not new, is it? 
people babbling, people just listening to, you know, TikTok clips of their kitty cat throwing a ball in the air or, you know, some, some crazy new thing. And what do we do? We get glued to it. You know, the reels on YouTube, all these things on how your dog can drive a truck or talk about how some way you felt hurt or, you know, I mean, and what do we do? We just like, so uh, we're, we got little Athenians in us in the way that we get so engaged and in, 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 enticed by hearing something strange and new. That, that's so, <laughs> so appropriate in the same way. We look at uh, Areopagus, this um, Mars hill. It is thought, and this, is a, this comes from the Greek god Ares, and the idea that somehow Mars had come down the war and had come upon this massive rock, um, and so it's the hill of Mars. It's the place there we're at. Uh, the, um, so they would go there, and this is where they would, they would come around. Now from there, um, they could look across and they could see some of the most amazing Areopagus, um, Acropolis, I'm sorry, Acropolis, which was a massive, massive building. Um, and you've probably seen the ruins in Greek, uh, tour guides and stuff, where you can go to Athens and see these amazing columns where you know, they, had been, they ended up being destroyed uh, and then rebuilt over time. What, what I think is amazing is that you think about how that would stir him up, knowing the history of all of these gods and everything. And now us looking 2,000 years later, where is this city, Athens, in the place of the world? It's in ruins. Is it, are the Stoics and the, you know, the Epicureans leading the way? Is this the center of the universe for knowledge anymore? No. No. Um, most of these places now are not as beautiful as we see like this picture depicting the when before it was destroyed and how amazing that those things now have become in a sense I think a testimony for us today to understand that those were temporary they may stand strong today like they did when Paul was standing on Mars Hill and looking around at this amazing view and feeling intimidated by it feeling, you know, I mean, people that would go there to Greek, uh, go to Athens, would look around and say, wow, they have over 200 gods. I mean, look at this. And just look at the amazing temples that they have. I mean, they must be doing something right. Haven't we thought, thought that? You know, we look at mega churches that are five, 10,000, filling up old, you know, uh, stadium, I mean, massive coliseums. And we go, wow, man, they must be doing it right. And get kind of intimidated by it and looking at church buildings, looking at the outside of those buildings, and understanding that, you know what, those buildings crumble, they collapse, they fall. But the Word of God and the truth remains the same. Um, these buildings are now standing in rubble. And tourists go there and look at them. And, you know, it's a, so I, I think it is the same way, the same type of setup that we find when we're approaching people that we want to try to bring the gospel to them is that it's very intimidating. Their background, their education, the city they're from, the setting in which you're gonna to talk to them could be very overwhelming. Uh, but at the same time, we need to stick to the truth. We need to stick to the truth. Um, and so as he stands there and we talk, this is an amazing introduction, something that uh, we look at. I want, I want to slow it down. I know you've heard it, most of them. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and he said, men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim. Now let's stop there because, you know, for the longest time I always saw that and to the unknown God. It's just, you know, um, when you say religious, it, that, that root word in the Greek as well has this idea of superstitious, superstition. Um, supernatural belief in something and so as he says you're religious you're you kind of have a superstitiousness in other words and they did I mean from uh, if you believe that none of those gods were real it was superstition wasn't it that 
any one of those gods was actually able to do anything would be superstitious, believing in something that's not there. So that's kind of what's interesting about the word being religious. But this unknown God is not random. It, this is not um, random. The, the inscription would have been uh, agnostos theos, agnostos theos which is in the Greek unknown God, but it was, in a, it was in a proper term. In other words, it wasn't vague. They really believed there was a God that they didn't know his name and that he was a real God. They weren't, they, because it goes back to uh, Epidemius, who was a philosopher in the sixth century uh, during the time of a plague in Athens, and they were sacrificing to every one of those gods. And they couldn't stop the plague. So they go to the oracle, who was high on gas, right? And so they would go to them, and they said, you need to go to Crete. You need to go and get this guy named uh, Epidemius and bring him. He'll know. So they go to Crete, and they bring this Epidemius there. And he's walking along, and he sees all these gods. And it's like, man, well, if they've appealed to all these gods, and that, that none of them have helped them get rid of this plague, there must be one we're missing. So he gathers them together, and he gets this prayer, and the prayer basically is, and he says, you know, we're, we're overlooking him, and that's the one we need to call in order to help fix this plague. So he prays to this God that they don't know, Theos, by the way, and, they, and he's, he's like apologizing that we didn't recognize who you are, um, and so we're going to offer a sacrifice, and this is what we'll do. We're going to get these sheep, and we're going to let them walk around. And then during the time of grazing, when they wouldn't lay down normally, right? I mean, you know, sheep are going to eat like our chickens. Like if I go out and throw down the food, none of them are going to sit there unless they're brooding on an egg. They're not going to stop and then go over and sit down, right? If my chickens, when I threw out the scratch, was to go over in there, one of them go sit down there, I think there's something terribly wrong with that chicken. So that's what he does. He says, black means you're really pleased. And so he takes his sheep anyway. And so he, he puts them out there and he says, when they're grazing, whichever one lays down during the time that they should be eating, we're going to put an altar there and we're going to sacrifice to you. So by the end of the day, apparently, I mean, there's some point where they end up sacrificing the different points and they, they name the God Theos that there's one God, but they didn't know his name. See, they knew he was there. He's there, but we don't have a name for him. And he showed us, so we sacrificed to him. And guess what? The plague went away. Now, medically, I think it ran its course. <laughs> so they know. So when we come back here to this setting, I want us to remember that, you know, I, I don't know how long you've probably been taught that, you know, this idea that, oh, yeah, the Greeks just decided, eh, okay, I can't remember any more names. Oh, ch -ch -ch -ch, unknown God. No, no. Now think about the Epicureans um, and the Stoics. They would know the story of Epidemius and the plague in Athens, wouldn't they? And that that's why when Paul says, I'm here to tell you about that one, you didn't know his name. So it's not random and very beautiful the way he ties that in. <sighs> We're going to have to stop. I see that he's very calculating, Paul is very calculating in saying, first I'm going to uh, say good things of what you're, what, what you're doing, but then he's going to bring, mm -hmm. there is an unknown. I'm here to tell you who it is. And I'd always heard that it was in case they missed a God, not that they didn't know the name, but just in case they did miss a God. And that's why that this, this offer was to an unknown God. But see, they, they knew. That's what I think that we've always missed, is that uh, Plato, um, Socrates, and another one, um, Xenophanes, was three popular philosophers at the same time as Epidemides, and they all had come up with this idea of this one Theos, and it was a proper name. Um, but they didn't know as far as like, but is Theos Bill? Is it Harry? 
but they had this concept. And so when Paul brings us in, he's almost saying, I'm getting specific now. I'm going to help bring to you that vagueness of this one. And that's what's beautiful is he's taking actual almost, you know how he would go to the, the prophets and the, and, the, and the law, Moses, for a Jew? You know what he's doing? He's going to their knowledge and he's going to bring it in. Now we know that because he's going to talk about one of their own poets, right? And so he is really coming at them with really their own information and their own knowledge. We're going to have to stop there. Uh, got on a roll there. But we'll pick it up next week. And I hope uh, God is with you. I hope you can be here at 1045 for worship, 4 p.m. this afternoon. We're going to be looking at Zephaniah, the prophet. And then we're still on that old Joseph in Egypt on Wednesday. So God bless. See you soon.